welcome everybody. I can see people are joining. Today is December 1st, 2020. Welcome to a Zoom workshop from Biographers International Organization. Um, as you may know, Bio has a worldwide membership of biographers, everything from veterans and experts to aspiring. And we also welcome lovers of biography in all of its forms. So if you're not already a member, we welcome you to join. Membership in bio is such a great deal, also makes a great present, gift of membership. And today's Giving Tuesday. So please remember bio in your Giving Tuesday 501c3 gifts. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us. You're in for a real treat. If you're here to learn more about preparing a book proposal or how to promote a book, or finding an agent, you're in for a treat. Between today's three guests, Anne Boyd Rue, Gretchen Gerzina, and Carla Kaplan, you've got the wisdom that comes from authoring, publishing, proposing a total of 18 books, including 13 biographies, and I think four more in progress or under contract, both trade and university press, for which these distinguished authors have earned grants and fellowships, very prestigious grants and fellowships. So just a little bit of housekeeping. In our time today, we'll spend about the first 30 minutes talking about book proposals, ending up with agents, do I need one, how do I get one, and then moving on to book promotion for about the last uh, 30 minutes, or not the last, but the next 30 minutes. And along the way, please submit any questions and follow-ups in chat. We'll be keeping an eye out for those. I wanna thank everybody who submitted questions in advance, and we're gonna to try to cover those to the best extent we can as they pertain to these topics. And um, if, if you have a question that pertains to another aspect of publishing and biography, please check out the amazing uh, workshops and panels that have already happened through BIO that are posted on the website. And be sure to follow BIO on Facebook and on Twitter. So with that, what I'm going to do is um, um, ask each of our panelists, we'll start with Gretchen, um, give us just a brief overview of your publishing history. Um, just how did you get all those books published? Gretchen? Um, my first book, I have done, I, I've just signed a contract for my 10th book. Four of them are biographies. Um, my first book, I discovered that I needed to get an agent um, and I never occurred to me and never thought about it. I was a young academic and a friend of mine who was a well-published novelist said, you need an agent. She contacted an agent who took me immediately and got me five offers. So I am a great believer in that help that they can offer with all of these aspects that we're gonna be talking to about today. And trade university? Oh yeah. yes, I've done both. I, I think I've done about 60% trade, 40% university, and um, I've had good experiences with all of them. Very similar experiences, actually. Excellent. And you, Carla? Um, for, I just want to say hi to everybody. I see quite a number of old friends and colleagues and associates, so this is really fun. Thank you all for being here. Um, like Gretchen, um, I have also worked both in trade and in academic. Um, I I'm on a contract currently trade for my eighth book, third biography. The first one that's a true cradle to grave biography. It's a life of Jessica Mitford that I'm doing with Harper Collins. Um, and I have also like Gretchen had good experiences across both trade and academic. I would say that um, there's a lot of confusion about what it means to go trade and a lot of confusion about why to do it. And I would say you have to have really good reasons for one or the other, um, besides a sort of notion of bigger audience or making more money. So the first book I did that was trade was Zora Neale Hurston's Letters, and there had never been a book of an African-American woman writer, artist, or intellectual's letters published at that time. And I felt it was really important that because it was Hurston and because of that history that the book make a big splash and that it be available publicly. Um, and I didn't want to go to the Hurston estate with my hand empty. 
and my hand out to them, I wanted to offer something. So that book was doubled in, um, which is about as trade as you can get. And that book led to my second group biography, Miss Anne in Harlem at HarperCollins. And um, I made a real deliberate decision that that book go trade. It could have been an academic book, but I really wanted to take the academic conversations about identity and identity crossing into a general audience. And I was very committed to a general audience for those reasons. And the current book is trade uh, because um, Jessica Mitford speaks to so many different people in the life she led. And I wanted to raise big questions about her life. Um, but these are very, trade books and academic books are not just different in audience or different in advance. They are really different kinds of books. And I think it's something we'll talk about today. And I might have more to say about that. Excellent, thanks Carla. And welcome, tell us a little bit about your publishing history. Um, sure, I've published three books and my first book was an academic book with Johns Hopkins. Um, I would not say that was a, a great experience. It was fine, but it was kind of a letdown. Uh, my book cost $85 and I think my mom and my dad bought it and that was about it. Maybe some libraries <laughs> and it took years for me to, uh, you know, hear from readers and to get reviews and things. So when I uh, was working on my biography of Constance Fenimore Wilson, I'm in my scholarship, I work on the recovery of lesser known women writers. And she's a writer who I felt really deserved to be more widely known and not just as the friend of Henry James. And so I decided, even though I had a contract with Johns Hopkins and I had missed my deadline and they weren't communicating with me and I didn't even know if I still had a contract. And so I decided to look for an agent and um, to see if, if this might be a sellable idea. And so I learned a lot about that process of, of making the transition. And it was an incredible experience. It was, it was way more than I could have imagined. It was, the book was, was reviewed on the cover of the New York Times Book Review, and which was a massive surprise. I never even thought to dream of, of that happening. And my last book um, is a biography of a book about little women. And so my two trade books are from Norton. Wonderful. That's terrific. And I just want to, and you know, there will be a lot of people on this who are aspiring or thinking about writing a biography. And um, I, I share, I guess, their view that, um, well, two things. One is belonging to bio puts you in close contact, shoulder to shoulder with giants in publishing biographies, like these three people on our panel today. Um, but there, there is for the lesser known. And if you're writing about a particularly unknown subject and you mm -hmm. don't have a track record in academia or in writing and in publishing, um, I was thrilled to get a university press knowing that there was going to be a lot less promotion and backing. And to this day, I just count my stars that as a you know, former lawyer, that's what I got. So uh, just remember the, the beauty of bio is you get to come in contact with the stars. Uh, but at every point along the way, there is something and, and there is lots of ways to enter this wonderful field. So we've, been, we've mentioned uh, all sorts of things. Carla, tell us first, let's, let's talk about this. What is a book proposal? Um, so I'm glad to be the first one to talk about this because when I um, did my second book proposal, I was such a failure at doing a proposal. And um, I was a failure over and over and over and over and over again. And I had to learn what it meant. The first proposal that I did was for the Hurston book and that proposal wrote itself. And the argument for that book wrote itself. But the second book, this group biography of white women who crossed into Black Harlem in the 1920s and 30s, I had this really complicated idea of the book and uh, my proposal kept trying to get at all the complications and my agent, um, all three of my trade books have been done with an agent, uh, different agent in the first than in the second two. Uh, and um, my agent kept saying, oh, you're so smart and this is so wonderful and it's so thoughtful and your research is incredible, start over. <laughs> I just had to keep starting over and over and over. And it took me a really long time to figure out what I was doing wrong. And even she couldn't quite say. 
And the way I think about it now is I go back to really early training I had in a completely different field. My parents were both social workers. My father did massive fundraising for social work organizations. And early on, I did some case statements associated with the work he was doing. And case statements are complicated multi-part reports for fundraisers that say why you should give your money to this organization and not some others. So they are high stakes documents that are all about why, why, why. And that's what a book proposal is. Carla, let me stop you there though. Who is it going to? Like the the book proposal is first, it's going ideally back and forth between you and your agent, and then it is going to publishers. So the book proposal is going to publishers to say, buy this book and not something else. Um, my first two trade books, the Zora Neale Hurston and the Miss Anne in Harlem, were both sold at auction. There's not so much of that now as there used to be. There was a bidding war on both. I ultimately did learn to write successful proposals. But here's what I had to unlearn. And now I'm talking to my fellow academics on the Zoom. Um, As an academic, the last thing, please don't be offended, I will explain this sentence. But as an academic, the last thing I was trained to be is interesting. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. As an academic, I was trained to be right. I was trained to be comprehensive. I was trained to be multi-layered. I was trained to do all sorts of things, but I actually wasn't trained to be interesting. You can be an incredibly successful academic and never be interesting. And it doesn't actually get in the way of your success. And the first thing a publisher wants to know, and the really the key thing about a proposal is, is it interesting and to who? Why would people spend $29.95 for this? Or $85. For and why is it interesting? And if it's only interesting because it's interesting to you because this person was your cousin, it's not a trade book. If you don't know why this would be interesting to others and who those others are, you're not ready to write the proposal yet. That doesn't mean you can write the proposal. There have been incredibly successful biographies of SALT. SALT was made interesting. Incredibly successful (laughs) biographies of race horses. Who cares? Race horses were made interesting enough for massive success. It's not about the subject. It's about your understanding of who it's interesting to and why. And the proposal is not you showing what a good researcher you are. It is not you showing how much time you can spend in the archives, though you will. It is about showing who it's interesting to and why it's interesting. It took me forever to understand this. Thanks, Barbara. Gretchen, at what point do you write the proposal in your journey of (laughs) writing a biography? Now, that's a really interesting question because like Carla, I, I had no idea what a proposal was. My first book was a biography of Carrington, Dora Carrington of the Bloomsbury Group. And nobody had done one on her. And I was lucky to have an agent, uh, actually had two agents, one in England and one in America, who um, could take it and run with it. Um, And I don't think at that point, I really had to write a huge proposal. What that came so easily to me, and it went, two of my books went to auction in the same way, that um, when I had to actually write a real proposal, for the book that actually got me the biggest um, advance. (laughs) It was painful. It was so painful. And so I had to learn a couple of things. First of all, I had to write more before I could write the proposal. I I hadn't written enough to be able to say the kinds of things that Carla's talking about. So I had to write maybe a chapter to get my head around it. And then the second thing was um, once I figured out, okay, now I'm ready to write a proposal. I realized I had to be a storyteller and that's what they want. They want story um, and they want to know that you can pull off the story and that you have enough evidence for whatever story you're going to tell. So I think the writing, when you feel confident enough that the writing is going to grab somebody because you want them to keep reading that proposal from the first page, whether you've written the whole book already, um, sometimes you've written half a book before you write the proposal and then you're in a better position on that 
you know, the problem with that is that you don't necessarily want to change what you've written and the proposal might make you want to change. And I think the other thing we should think about it, at what point do, are we able to answer the other questions? So the first is what's the story? How are you going to tell it? What's in it? What are the chapters is the next one. And then also the marketing is in there too. Who's going to buy it? What books do you compare this to? Um, if there's nobody else written a book like this, why is that? And what will yours do? Can you compare yours to a bestseller so this can piggyback on it, but not be the same thing? That's a, a good thing to, to have too. But I think at what point it varies. I actually didn't learn how to write a good proposal until my agent slipped me the proposal of another successful author. And, and I read that. This author does not know to this day that I've read this. Um, and it was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous. And I said, oh, okay, now I see it. Before I was trying to do it in some abstract what way. What made it so fabulous? What made it? Oh, it told stories. It started right off the bat with a, a story that grabbed my attention. The writing was exquisite. And then I just wanted to read the book. It hadn't even been written yet. I mean, at that point it had been written, but uh, when she did the proposal, I hope so she. Um, and then um, I thought, <laughs> Oh, okay. I didn't know that you had to engage. You have to engage them right at the beginning and not just say, I've done research on this for 10 years and now I'm ready to write and you Absolutely. should like it because I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And let me ask you this. Should a proposal look different if you're submitting it to a trade press as opposed to academic press? And, and in that question, you know, can you touch on the fact that many academic presses now have general trade divisions? So take any aspect of that you wish. Okay, so sorry, I do want to mention that several of our viewers find it hard that that Carla and I'm sure also Gretchen could ever be uninteresting. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I, yes, I second that. Um, so to, the answer to your question, Marlene, is yes and no. So this, the proposals have to have the same parts, right? And they both have to have an awareness of audience and who will buy the book. Um, but and for train books- And what are those parts? What are the parts? If you, yeah, um, in general. Well, yeah, you need a, an overview, which is kind of your introduction, um, which I can talk more about. That's kind of the most important part. Um, you need chapter summaries, you need a marketing, promotional part, you need an author bio. Um, the whole thing can be, you know, 50, 60 pages long, or it could be, you know, on the shorter side, once you have an agent, right? If you're working for a trade, if you're trying to get a trade publisher, once you have an agent, they it can kind of help you, um, you know, think through some of those little pieces. But the main thing you need is your overview that really sells the book, right? As, as Gresham was saying, you need to really wow them with a sense of what this book will look like on the shelf. Okay. And what it, like, even to the extent of knowing what the, uh, the jacket copy would be, I know it is so hard to think about that or when you're still early on in the process, and that might be a good reason for waiting until you've written a whole draft, especially if this is your first one. I didn't try to get an agent until I'd written the whole book beginning to end. So I knew the story and I still had a lot of work to do at that point to try to sell it. Um, but it's, it's getting that really, that sense of, how this book will be marketed. Because unfortunately you cannot expect the publisher to pick up something, you know, that you just lay out there as a story of blah, right? So, you know, do with it what you will. And the publisher will take that and figure out how to sell it. They don't have the time, frankly. And to be honest, I don't know that they always have the right expertise to figure out how to sell books. A lot of people in publishing actually sort of talk about that. Um, they're throwing up all kinds of different things all the time. But, but really, if you can do that legwork for them, if you can show them how to sell this book, um, you know, what will really make it stand out? So that kind of awareness of the marketplace is so important for a trade book proposal, okay? So for trade proposal, you're trying to get the attention of an agent, first of all, and then you probably continue to work on it with that agent and they will send it out to editors, right? For an academic press, you're trying to please, first of all, an acquisitions editor, and then they're going to send it out to experts in the field, okay? So they're gonna send it out to reviewers to review your, your 
scholarship and your manuscript. And they're really looking at, you know, you know, the argument for your book, what it contributes to the existing body of knowledge, right? It's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a very different audience, really. Even if that, even if it is um, uh, the, the trade arm of an academic press, they're still going to send it out to experts in the fields, right? So that process takes a lot longer too. Um, it's just a completely different method of publishing. Um, but for whether you're going trade or academic, I do want to recommend the book, and I'll put this in the chat for you, the link to it, uh, Susan Rabiner's book, Thinking Like Your Editor. Unfortunately, it's getting a little bit dated, but I think her basic uh, advice is still very sound. And she tells writers that they need to tell the story of how they discovered the topic or what they discovered in their research, right? So the, her emphasis on the opening of your proposal is telling that story to kind of bring uh, the readers of the proposal into the story that you're telling. And that's not necessary that you do that, but that is kind of one of the things that she really points to. And I do at some point want to talk about your lead in or your hook, how you will kind of encapsulate um, selling this book in, you know, a few sentences, but I can do that later. Right. And also I just want to mention Susan Rabiner is a longtime bio member as well. And she's an agent, right? She's a longtime agent. So she's got, and an editor. So she's got a lot of perspective that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, Gretchen, I think the scariest part for me was actually including a sample chapter because, you know, it was like putting the, the rubber met the road. Tell us about how you pick the sample chapter and, and what about that as, as one of those integral parts of the proposal? You know, I think our impulse is to write a book from beginning to end. And sometimes you don't write a book in the order in which you're going to, one would finally read it, that you might, I, for the next proposal that I'm working on now, I've chosen a chapter that comes later in the book, just because I think it's interesting, it's unusual, and it will make the, the agent, my agent, or an editor uh, want to say, oh, what comes before this? This is so interesting. So I think pick the chapter that speaks to you and demonstrates what it is that, that you feel that you can do with this and shows all those pieces that Anne was just talking about, those pieces of, of um, you know, it may not stay the same. The chapter may change. It may be in progress. But, but um, I think picking a chapter is hard. I think I, for the last one, I think I sent the first chapter first, but I don't always do that. And academic presses um, may want to see it in a different order. They may want to see how you get into it. You know, one of the things that I learned best um, that helped me a lot um, that's not available to everybody is that I did a nationally syndicated radio program on with interviewing authors. Um, it went out to 100 stations and I did that for 15 years and went out to mostly NPR stations. And in the course of that, I got just zillions of books. You know, I mean, books that you never want to read. My favorite was um, How to Survive Your Boyfriend's Divorce. And I, I, didn't, I didn't interview that author. <laughs> and the books that we didn't care about were like the, the story, which could be interesting, of your grandfather in World War II or some, you know, something that was more personal family history. Um, but those publicists send out what is like a mini proposal, you know, that they send with every book copy that they send to markets, they send out a page or two of, you know, wow, when Carla Kaplan was first found the papers of Zora Neale Hurston and realized that they hadn't been published, it was a wonderful find. You know, they kind of get the hook right away. And I think sometimes publicists can know about um, what the market wants. And so there's, you know, I don't know how to do that except to say, okay, I've read enough of these now to think I need to figure out how to, how to do this as well. I haven't found any difference necessarily between the academic and the trade presses I've worked with, um, except that I think that um, you're a bit more on your own with some of them than you might expect. I think maybe- um, A bit more on your own with an academic press. Yeah, it's sometimes, you know, I, I, my trade 
I was really lucky with one of my trade books that the editors were just in there at every moment and they would pick up on things that were wrong or that they would fix something. Um, I've seen a lot of academics saying that their books are not being edited or promoted in the same way because the, they're just strapped for money and they don't have those people to, to do that kind of copy editing. Um, so, uh, and that's just something to keep in mind. I've had good luck with both academic and trade presses um, but I think times have changed since I did my first books and then now, yeah. Let me ask you this, we've had in the chat as well as a submitted question about the idea of creating a sample chapter and that is cannibalizing all the goodies that you've got and making one up even though you don't currently expect it to be the chapter. What, what are your thoughts on that? Who who's of you, who wants to take that? Give me some eye contact here. Carla? You want sure. To um, so there, so the, the first thing I wanna say is there are all kinds of formula available. And I think Rabiner's is one of the great ones. I, I suggest Rabiner's book to all kinds of people. And, there, and so one might look for a formula on what is the right sample chapter. And I want to take this question by starting by saying there's no right formula. You can successfully cannibalize. If you are somebody who can pick the engaging pieces of a number of different chapters and pull them together in a way that makes them seem structurally coherent, then by all means cannibalize. I am not someone who can do that. If I pull pieces from different chapters, the structure implodes for me in the middle and there's no sense of synthesis or structure or logic. That just happens to be the way I work. I can't cannibalize. The point is you want to have your sample chapter be A, the single most interesting chapter in the book, and be the one that demonstrates the fullest range of your skill sets. So the one with the absolute best writing, the one that demonstrates the way you handle your source material, the one that demonstrates how your narrative arc is moving, the one that demonstrates whatever it is it, that's part of the case you're making for this book. You want to always think about each piece of the proposal as making a case. Mm. You are always making an argument in the proposal and the sample chapter is in a way the most important piece of your argument. It's the one that demonstrates everything you claim is true about you in the proposal. So if in the proposal you say, I know how to speak to varied audiences, boy, your sample chapter better show that. If in the proposal you say, this book is critical because I have new material that nobody has ever seen. I am the first person to ever find, your sample chapter better give some taste of that. It's your chance to make your case. Mm -hmm. So it is whatever is strongest. And in my experience, that is rarely the first chapter. Gretchen is an, is an exception to this because she's such an amazing writer. <laughs> but, but for most of us, the writing, writing, skills authors, writing skills do help. <laughs> yeah, in, in a lot of cases, and for a lot of books, the first chapter is sort of setting the stage, setting the context, and sometimes there's some throat clearing in it. Yeah. If that's true, do not use it. Use the most engaging chapter is what I would say. And if you can do that by cannibalizing, great. And if you can't pick a different one, I don't think there's an absolute rule here, except it has to be your absolute best one. Thanks, Carl. Anne, did you want to add something? Yeah, I have just a couple of things to add. Um, when we did a workshop like this with agents, and that recording is available on the bio website, I highly recommend it. The agent panel, they talked about at one point, um, some agents, and I know a friend of mine did this, her agent asked her to do this, will write instead of doing a regular proposal a sample chapter, what they did was like a 50, 60 page, you know, mini version of the book itself. 
So, you know, the kind of the cannibalizing idea, but that was the proposal, right? So mm -hmm. this is what the book will look like. And I, that terrifies me. <laughs> I'm so glad my agent hasn't asked me to do that. I'm taking her, you know, more traditional, uh, you know, doing the chapter summaries and a sample chapter. And his advice to me for the cha sample chapter is uh, to write a scene, right? So you're picking a scene that particularly illustrates uh, the, the, your subject and what you're writing about. And it shows that you can do that kind of storytelling, that kind of emotional grab of the reader uh, that really hooks people in. And uh, the other thing I would add is that for one of my proposals, uh, for the sample chapter that we're, might think of it as a writing sample instead of an actual chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I included uh, my preface, which was a couple of pages to kind of set the scene and then, uh, and then a, piece, a piece of a later chapter. Um, and that, that seemed to work through. So there are different approaches you can take. I used the preface because it was done, you know, that was <laughs> <perfect. laughs> We have a question here. Can you talk about relationship of hook intro to sample chapter, can they be part of the same scene or moment? Gretchen, does that question speak to you? See, I'm not sure about that. Um, first of all, I think that the, just to say something about the sample chapter, they're not going to go back. And if you get the contract and you're going to write the book, they're not going to go back and say, oh, well, you said something differently in your sample chapter. Where is that? They don't even remember. That's just gone. You know, it's to get you in the door and get the contract. And then you write the book as the best way the book needs to be written. Um, so the hook, I think, is to get them reading. Um, but I think, I don't know, I would probably submit a different chapter that demonstrates how the hook operates through that chapter, rather than saying, here's my hook, and now I'm going to make it longer. Um, I think, I, I don't know if that's the way others might see it. Um, but yeah. That, I think the hook is something really totally different. Yeah. Is it yeah. Sort of like is it like the elevator pitch? It is. You, yeah, yeah. I, I had a couple of things I wanted to say about the hook because I've been working with some writers working on their proposals. And this, I think, is probably the hardest thing to do Yeah. Um, because it's not a brief description. It's not a summary of your book. It's what makes the reader hungry for more. It creates suspense. Um, it tells people what to expect from your book and you need to do this in a couple of sentences. Um, and it's something that you need to have as early in the process as you can get it, but sometimes it's hard to do that. But you really, you have to consider, especially if you are writing to agents, you've got about 30 seconds to entice them and get them interested or they're on to the next thing. <laughs> they get so many queries that they can't pay attention to every one. Um, so you need to really grab them. You need to think in terms of what kind of story you're telling, what's the big question that your book answers. You can lay out the central conflict of your book, describe the emotional journey of your subject. So thinking in terms of story and narrative arc and really summing that up in a pithy way. Um, and think about what makes your story distinctive and compelling, but also what makes it a particularly marketable story and why now? So those are all kinds of things that you need to think about that maybe can help you um, really grab readers. Is there an anniversary coming up? Is there a connection to contemporary events? Are there similar books uh, on this topic or that take a similar approach that have been really popular? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people are, are selling books in the hidden figures vein, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, one tip I have for writing your hook, which I have found extremely difficult, I think I've figured it out, but it's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, I would suggest that you look at the jacket copy of books like yours. How do they sell how do they convince the reader to flip open the book or better yet, buy it, right? So that is, uh, you know, thinking of, of that kind of language that they use in jack the jacket copy of books has been very helpful to me. And, and the, your comp titles, right? We've, we've mentioned comp titles a couple of times. That can be, it can be either comparative books or competitive books. I think um, what what agents are going to be primarily interested in is comparative books, right? So they use these comp titles to help them figure out how many copies your book is likely to sell. Okay. If you're, if your book, if they can pitch it as in the vein of, you know, in the garden of beasts by Eric Larson, right. Or um, in the vein of a woman of no importance by Sonia Purnell, that's gotten so much great press and, and won the bio award. Or the, I'm sorry, the Plutarch Award last year for the best biography. I mean, these are the kinds of books that, um, you know, can give them a kind of benchmark. Um, but 
it's probably not the best idea, especially for your first book to try to sell it as it's going to be in the next bestseller, the next Eric Larson, right? But you want to pick books that are, um, you know, written recently, five, 10 years, maybe the most, and books that are maybe written like yours in the style of yours or in the same vein about similar kinds of people. If it's civil war stuff, right? You've got a lot to choose from. Uh, so you, you want to give them a sense of, of what your book might look like. Thanks, Anne. Carla, you wanted to add? I wanted to add two things. Um, and, and this goes along with my theme that there's no set rules, but there are useful formula. Let me tell you what your hook isn't. And, and, I, and I do mean this as an absolute rule. Uh, there's um, If you're writing biography, your hook is not about you. The hook is never about I first became interested in Arctic explorers when I was only 14, but then I became a dentist. And I had 35 years as, oh, you think I'm joking. I had 35 years as a dentist and then I became interested in Arctic explorers again. <laughs> that is never your hook. Nobody's interested in that except you. You are, and that's fine, but it's not interesting to other people. And a really good way to get a strong sense of what's a working hook and what isn't is to read other people's proposals in some version or judge contests. I've been lucky enough to get a lot of outside fellowships. Eventually I learned to write a proposal, but it took me a really long time and I've had a Guggenheim and an NEH and others. And as a consequence, I'm asked to serve on a lot of juries reviewing other people's fellowship proposals. And I do it a lot and I do it all over the country. I also do it because I founded a humanity center and I judge contests. And I do it partly because it's service but because also it reminds me, it helps train me, it helps me learn. And if you've never seen another proposal of any kind, it's really hard to write one. Volunteer for something. Your local library probably has a contest and they probably need judges. And the more you can see what works and doesn't in proposals you get, the more you will understand why I say that I was 14 when I first became interested in Arctic explorers is never your hook. Thanks, Carla. And I wanna, I wanna just, just- Let me just also <laughs> add that uh, for those who have tried and failed at uh, getting <laughs> wonderful scholarships and proposals, there is a silver lining because um, although I'm expert at law, I didn't really understand the proposal business as it applied to scholarships and grants, but a little birdie told me, be sure to ask for the evaluations. There's gold in yes. our nose. And when you see what people like Carla and other reviewers are saying that you were lacking, which these anonymous reviewers do, it, it's wonderful. And I ended up, you know, just by pure will, um, you know, getting some scholarships and grants. So those, those that rehearsing and doing and seeing examples is crucial. Um, did somebody have something to add? Because we have got so much more. Oh, yeah, Okay, the only thing, this is just a quick thing, and I totally agree, because I've served on those reviews, and I've served on prize committees, and all of those things, it teaches you an awful lot about why things are working, and why they're not, and how they missed the boat. On the other hand, I've also seen reviewers who missed the point, and when we got, we, you know, I got the things back at something I didn't get, and I said, but that's not what I said, um, but, and so those comments don't always come through. But one thing I wanted to say to Carla, the hook about you know wanting to be an Arctic explorer, when I was writing uh, Mr. and Mrs. Prince, which was about two 18th century enslaved people in Massachusetts and Vermont, later in Vermont, it was an interesting story by itself. And you know I was able to track down a lot of stuff, but it wasn't until um, halfway through the research after I had a contract that I discovered that I was actually descended from the white family that had owned the people I was writing about. I remember this. And that was a hook. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. <laughs> so there are ways to use a personal aspect of it, but not to tell your whole life story and you know how you came back to want to be in this. Because I had no idea when I decided to write about these people that this was going to be the case. So there is a place for that if you had been, you know, you won a Nobel Prize in, in you know, in physics, you know, you might want to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gretchen. I just wanted to add that I 
I just put in the chat a link. If um, I, I put together a list of prompts that you can use to kind of try to write your hook that I've found. Oh, I've also seen a lot of proposals as a, as a grant reviewer for the NEH, but then also um, my agent sent me some and I've asked for friends, right? I've asked other people. And once you get to know people in bio, you know, you can just say, I'm really, I'm working on a proposal. Would you be interested in sharing one with me, that kind of thing. And there are some also on the bio website for members, um, but these are prompts and things that I've seen, or, you know, just kind of a Mad Libs sort of thing to fill in the blank that might kind of help you figure out how, what would make a successful hook, if you would like that it's in the, in the yeah. chat. And Michael Gately, our wonderful executive director, um, if I can ask you to also at the end, file the chats so that we, we can maybe follow up more generally in the newsletter or something if we don't get to all the questions. Anybody, anybody can save the chat at any time if you want to do that. Anybody who's watching. I'm going to forget. For yourself. You know, uh -huh. forget. Um, thank you. Um, because there's also a lot. And if there's anyone in there who for some reason wants to be contacted, please remember it doesn't save your email address. So if there's something in particular, you know, go ahead and add that in. Um, so let's talk now about, you know, the, the, the other side of this, we've touched on it, and that is the proposal needs to have a marketing section. So Anne, talk a little bit about how important is that marketing section? You know, what is your goal? Um, and then we'll talk about the A word, the agent in the process here. So tell First, we need to talk about the P word, which isn't necessarily proposal or promotion, it's platform. Uh, you've probably heard that term trade. If you're writing a nonfiction book, you're told you must have a platform, right? You must have thousands of followers and newsletter subscribers and whatnot. And that can sound really scary. Um, but it's, I think it's really important to, if you're, if, especially if you're interested in a trade press, is that you show them that you have connections to people in your field um, and a readership, right? That you're developing a relationship with people um, that you know, um, it's, it's a lot more than your social media following, but it's, all, it's also about um, people that you know in the media, people you could write to for book reviews, speaking engagements, interviews, podcasts, right? You can show them the different podcasts that you, uh, maybe if you know people, that's great, but also it can just be, uh, you know, you've done some research and you know that these types of podcasts um, or, you know, programs would be interested in your book. Right. So you're showing them that you have an awareness that you're going to be a partner, basically, in this process, because they, you really can't expect them to do too terribly much. And the more you look like you're coming in as a professional who's not just good at writing a book, but can also help sell it, that is going to help a lot. So um, also, if you know about any specialized publications or groups of history buffs or fan clubs or any of those kind of people that your publicist might not know about, you can depend on them to send out advanced reader copies to the major publications, but anything more specialized, they're probably not gonna know about. Um, you can mention your previous track record if you have one. If you do have one, they will be looking up your sales figures, um, but you can share with them the kinds of publicity that you did, the connections that you've made with producers or reviewers or interviewers and all of that. Um, it's also, I think, helpful to have a website where they can look you up and they can see how you're presenting yourself online. Um, you might include photos if you have a video of a talk. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's okay to say something like, I'm comfortable in front of cameras and, you know, on the, on the radio or microphones. I've been interviewed, you know, blah, 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 given talks. But if you also have some evidence that you can show them that you are somebody who's engaging, um, that can be helpful. But uh, you can also just, it's really important to mention that you're willing and ready to contribute to uh, marketing and publicizing the book, that you're willing to do in line or online events, in-person events, write pieces um, to publish or on the topic of your publication or your book. Um, and also this is becoming, I think, more common is to include the names of people that you know that you could maybe ask for blurbs for your book. Now, in my case, um, I was asked to, when my agent was selling my book to an editor, I was asked to actually take that a step further and actually ask somebody 
and um, who would make a commitment before I'd even written the book, before I was, you know, was finished, before I was done, <laughs> which seemed, which was totally scary for me to do. But I found, I mean, Elaine Showalter, who's the most wonderful person, has been so supportive, agreed to do it. And it was just, it was incredible. I think it's what helped me ultimately sell the book. Um, but if you can at least show that you have thought of people who would be willing to, might be willing to support you in this endeavor, people who've published similar books or have a following already, uh, that can really help. So it's very important for, this is, I mean, I've been kind of talking about trade, but I think academic presses are becoming increasingly very concerned about this because their budgets have been getting smaller and smaller. So you really need to do it for them too, as much as you can. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Even including things like the professional affiliations of your subject, knowing that, you know, if they were involved in fraternities and sororities and had close ties to alma mater and other things um, helps in terms of, of groups that are interested in it. Um, Gretchen or Carla, anything you want to add to that before we turn to the A word? The I, think, I think there is a place, and in my last book, um, they asked for names of potential peer reviewers. Um, they weren't necessarily going to choose them, and they had some in mind, but there were some that I knew of who would have been uh, excellent for this subject, and they took that seriously. So I think even ahead of the publicity part, you might want to make sure that they know uh, that you're well-connected enough that these people might be appropriate to review your proposal, um, especially if it's an academic book, but trade books, they don't always, but sometimes do, send out for review. Um, but peer review in academic presses is really important. So it's good to have, um, you know, I, I put one or two heavy hitters in there, um, just as, even if they didn't go to them, to say these are people who know this field and who might be willing to, to support this proposal um, or review it. So you know, it, it depends. But yeah, you're right that the line between academic and trade is is blurring. Now, I think Yale does as many trade books now as, as academic books. I Yeah. Um, and Norton does books that might have only been considered academic books in the past. So um, it's not all so clear cut. Carla, anything to add? And then we have a question I want to toss out as well. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. If people are, are worried about not having heavy hitters in their pocket, you know, mm. if you're listening to this and you're worried that you don't know um, Anne Elaine Showalter, you don't have to have heavy hitters and you don't have to have a phenomenal sales record. What you have to remember is that you are making an argument and the argument includes a why you. Why are you the right person yeah. to write this book? Yeah. And if you have heavy hitters who can help with the why you, or you have a track record of good sales and being on the cover of the New York Times book review, <laughs> that makes the case for why you. But there are lots of ways to make the why you case. And as long as you remember that that's your job, you are convincing an agent and a publisher that you are the right person, the yeah. ideal person, maybe the only person who could write this book and this book needs to be out there, that's enough. And so mm -hmm. I just want to reassure people, you don't have to have this incredible track record behind you if you can make a case for yourself. That's got, really important. Yes. Got an interesting question, which is if, and, and you may not have the experience to answer this either, e e any of you, if past sales have not been great, um, is it better to ignore that or omit it? Uh, of a particular book, you know, in your past. You know, they can look that up. They will look that up. <laughs> right. And I don't think you have to make a big deal out of it. They're going to look that up and they're going to do with it what they will. Um, and publishers don't b base every purchase on projected sales. Sometimes publishers, and I speak from experience here, want your book because they want the reviews and they want that press and they want the national attention even more than they want the sales. They, sometimes they want your book because they have been worried for the last year and a half that they haven't done anything on blah, blah, blah. And they've been looking for something on blah, blah, blah. And your book comes in and it's on that. Mm -hmm. And you can't game that. You don't know what those conversations have been like. 
So, it, you know, of course, huge sales helps, right? But the lack of huge sales is not something you should start off apologizing for or make a big deal out of, or maybe even reference. I would say play to your strengths, whatever those are. Um, whatever, and, and if it's a first book, again, it's the why you argument. I would never in myself in a book proposal actually give sales numbers. They look that up. I don't do that. Um, so I wouldn't over worry that. Thank you. All right, now let's move to, to the uh, perhaps more daunting question or more mystical one. Do I need an agent and how do I get one? Anne, you wanna take a first crack? Uh, yes. So um, as I mentioned before, there's a recording of the workshop we did with agents, which was fabulous. I really highly recommend you look at that. It's on the bio webpage. Um, I think the first thing is to make sure that you have a solid proposal and a killer sample chapter um, that you're really ready to go. And they will probably, if they're interested in your query, uh, they will ask you for the first 10 pages. So you wanna have those ready. And, and they what, probably won't ask for your whole sample chapter. But what's so the important, what? What's a query? I'll, I'll go over that. But I just wanna say what you need to have ready first before you do anything, right? And those first, the first 10 pages that they ask for doesn't have to be your first 10 pages. That was a rookie mistake that I made. The first agent who was interested, I sent her my first 10 pages and it was stuff about ancestors and, you know, it was really boring. Okay, so don't do that. Uh, you want to give them something, you know, from the sample chapter that you've, that you've prepared. Okay. So uh, I also want to mention that, you know, you probably, if you want to try the, you know, try the literary marketplace and see, is this a trade book? Is this a university press book? An agent can still do that for you. There are agents who work with university presses, right? We've discussed a lot of university presses now have a, a trade division, and so they get queer, they get submissions from agents. So an agent is really um, a great thing. I don't think there's a reason not to get an agent, to be perfectly honest. Um, so it's very important <laughs> for the query that you explain right off why you're reaching out to them. So you don't just send them the whole thing. There are some agents, actually, you should check their websites and see if they have specific instructions for what to submit, how to query them. But most of them just want a little paragraph. You know, are you interested in this, basically? So the first thing you need to do is explain right off why you're reaching out to them, what authors or books are on their list that are similar to yours. You want to assure them that you're not wasting their time, right? Because they get so many queries. Uh, flattery doesn't hurt either. I've been really impressed. Uh, you know, if you wrote to somebody who's maybe done a talk, I mean, I always look for these people online and see if I can get to know them a little bit. And then you can write to them and, and uh, you know, show them this isn't totally out of the blue or off the wall. You have a real reason for reaching out to them and that will make them invest you know, the next 30 seconds, a minute to read your query. And if they're interested, they'll ask for, uh, they'll ask for more. And that's when you give them your hook, right? That's when you, uh, the query, I should say, is when you lay their, your hook on them. That's what your query needs to have. So why you're reaching out to them, what your hook is, include some comp titles to help explain what your book is like. It's X meets Y is kind of the standard formula, but you don't necessarily have to be that predictable. Um, for academic presses, if you want to just go straight to them instead of to an agent, you're going to look up the acquisition editors on the website and see who is, you know, in literature, history, science, whatever your field is, or, you know, if you're writing a biography, right, it'd be the person, uh, the kind of the general subject area. And it's a good idea to look for presses with series uh, related to your topic, or they have books published like yours. So again, you're trying to find somebody who's, who's gonna have some interest in this. It's not just totally blind. And for finding agents, um, always look in the acknowledgement sections of the books of your comp titles. I would start there and look these people up. I also recommend that you get a subscription to Publishers Marketplace which is I think $25 a month. You just do it for a month and then you can, uh, you can cancel. But that shows you can look in their database, you can look at who has sold all the different books, right? And not everything is reported, but a lot of it is. You can learn a lot about um, who the agents are and what kind of deals they're making, who they're selling to, all kinds of different things in there. Gretchen, Carla, wanna add? 
Um, I would say that the biggest mistake you can make with a query to an agent is not looking at what their targeted interests are. So if you are writing a YA biography and you're sending it to someone who does something totally different, then you're not doing yourself any favors and you're wasting their time. Um, and they may not even respond to you. So make sure that you're finding someone who works in an area that, that you're writing in. That's first of all. The second thing is I think some people are nervous about getting an agent because they think it takes money from them because the agents get a cut, but almost always they get you more money than you would have done on your own and even um, help you with contract. Um, so I, my, my next book is with a university press. I got very little advance, but I've always gotten an advance. And I said to my agent, hey, you're not gonna really get anything out, out of this, but would you mind looking over the contract? And my agent was really able to say, you didn't look at this clause really carefully. Look what they're gonna to do to you or here's something over there. So I presented a list kind of with trepidation of seven changes and they accepted all but one and one was because of a legal reason they couldn't do it. Um, so it, it, the agent is invaluable. They also know who's out there in publishing um, who would be really interested in your kind of book and they can target those editors and even sometimes set up a meeting with them or a conversation. Um, and I just, I can't say enough good about having an agent. You know, they've gotten me more money, they've gotten me a better contract and they found me um, editors that I, and publishers that I might never have considered. Um, so I, I do think they're invaluable and they can help with dramatic rights. Should you ever be that lucky <laughs> to get a movie made of something you want to do, they're, they're right in there for you. Well, and it's not only movies, it would also be a consultant on a documentary. Absolutely, yeah. All sorts of, of things. Carla, you want to add? I just, yeah, I, I want to agree with everything that's been said and add um, a couple of things. Um, I think an agent is a wonderful thing if it's a good agent. Right. Um, I've had two agents. My current agent, um, I adore. I adore her as a person and I adore her as a professional. I think she's just extraordinary. Um, a good agent is a wonderful thing. Yeah. But an agent isn't necessarily. Right. Um, and it is a complicated relationship. If you have an agent, the relationship is always a very complex one. And it really is a relationship. And a bad agent, uh, it's, you can feel like you're in a bad marriage. So uh, an agent is wonderful if the agent is good. Um, the other thing I wanna say is if you know you're aiming for an academic press and it's a first book, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about getting an agent. No, no. Anne's experience and Gretchen's experience is slightly different in this regard as is mine. If I were doing an academic book now, when I do an academic book, I will sometimes show my agent the contract, even though she's not getting 10%. And I would say, is there anything here that's a little weirder that I should be aware of? Or I'll talk to her about what I'm doing. Um, and that's different because we have a working relationship. Yes. In Gretchen and Anne's case, Gretchen and Anne are superstars and the agent is gonna stay with them even if they're doing a sort of quirky book for, for one book. The agent <laughs> is gonna stick with them because of who they are and they're superstars. But if you are doing a first book and it's going to be academic, you are likely to be looking at an advance in the thousands if you're very lucky and an agent's 10% of that could be $150 or $300. They can't work for that. They just right. can't. Right. It doesn't work for them. It, it, their economic model doesn't allow for that. So for a first book author who's definitely ending up with an academic book, it may be very hard to get an agent because they're looking right. at the economics of that. They're looking at the fact that if this writer gets a $2,500 advance, my 10% is 250. I can't read eight versions of their proposal for that. So you have to be able to see this from their side is all I'm saying. Right, and that's if you get actual money. In my case, without okay. an agent, first book, I was thrilled to get what I now know is called a writer first refusal contract, which was simply their promise that if I came up with a publishable manuscript, 
They'd read it. They would do it. And, and that is huge. I don't want anyone to think I am still grateful as a, you know, an unpublished author that I was able to get that. They're all, everything is a win. Um, yeah, the one thing I wanted to add to that was um, the writer first refusal means they get the first look at your next book. It doesn't mean that they ha have an obligation to publish it right. uh, or that you are obligated to go with them. It just means that they get the first crack at it. Um, but the second thing is um, I'm working with students um, who have graduated and gone on to write books. Some of them have told me that they approached an agent who wanted a fee to read their um, query and read the proposal. And that's something I, I would caution against. Um, I think my experience is that reputable agents don't charge you if they say, I want you, know, I want you to take a look at this and, and think about representing me. They should not be, you, you should not be giving them money ever. Um, that is not a reputable agent and it might well not be an agent that editors want to work with either. Um, so that's just a caution. Excellent, thank you. Asks in the chat, how do you, know when you have a bad agent you know okay <laughs> um i yeah i had to i had to uh leave a sever a relationship with my agent and it was yeah it was it was really awful i hated doing it um but it had become clear to me that she didn't believe not that she didn't believe in me and my work but she didn't believe that publishers were paying you know people to write books and i wasn't I, as I got to know people in the industry, I learned that people are making a lot more money than I'm making. <laughs> Maybe I should try another agent. Um, and it's never going to be the kind of money that lets you, you know, write the book for a year or two. I mean, it, it, it may be eventually, I hope so, um, to give me that time, but it's really, the money is, there's not a lot of money regardless, I would say, especially, I don't think biography is a particularly lucrative field <laughs> in the publishing world of, you know, so we're not going in it just for that, but you still want to make it worth your while and get this, make work worth your while and get the support that you need uh, to do travel, to do research, to market the book, to hire a publicist, you know, all of those things, you know, you can do with your advance. And before we switch to uh, promotion, a book that's been published or is in the works, I just want to say that as a lawyer of some 30 years, when I actually got my contract, it was Greek. I, you know, I know how to read a contract. And so um, there is lots to be said about getting, whether it is an agent or a friend or a published author to look at it. In my case, I went to a publishing lawyer, um, but used what I learned. There, there's nothing transparent about the publishing world, unfortunately, I've learned. So let's turn to the promotion part of the book. And what do we mean by it? And when does it start? Uh, right now um, would be my short answer. So <laughs> I think, yeah, you, you need to um, start as soon as you can. And it can be some, it can be just as simple as getting to know people in your little corner of the literary or scholarly world, right? That you're laying the groundwork, you're letting people know that you're writing this book. If you have, well, do you have a website? If you don't have a website and you're writing a book, you should have a, you should get a website going. Um, you probably, you need social media accounts and, and make sure that on your website and on your social media accounts, your little bios say that you're writing a book about such and such, right? And start talking about the fact that you're doing this and not in a spammy kind of weird way, but in a, you know, informational kind of, I'm sharing, you know, what I'm learning with other people kind of way. So the most important thing is to write a great book. Okay, so don't get too freaked out about all the promotional stuff, because that I think can overwhelm a lot of us, especially if we're new to this. But it's, you know, if it's sapping your energy and taking time away from you writing a great book, then it's too much, right? The most important thing I think is to find your people and to make, make uh, connections to educate yourself about publishing and about the marketplace. And I actually have some some links that I'll share with you that some people who I think are pretty reliable sources of information about the publishing world and marketing and things like that, that I had found really helpful. Um, and I will say this about social media. You do not have to do all the different social media platforms. Okay. Pick one that you're comfortable with and stick with it. I would recommend Twitter. 
I think Twitter is the best uh, way to connect with people because you can have conversations with people, with anybody. They don't have to be followers of you, right? And you can get the attention of people out there who might retweet something that you've, you know, that you've, that you've put up, right? And so you, you can look at what kind of content people are posting that gets um, interest. You know, you can be sharing things. I would also consider creating a newsletter. So the conventional wisdom is that it's the best way to connect directly with readers. It can take a while, kind of a long time to build up your uh, newsletter list, but um, you want to make sure that you're offering people in your newsletter, not just news about you because they don't know you yet, right? You want to give them something else that they value. So my um, the publicity or the marketing people at Norton suggested that in my newsletter, make it about little known women writers, which is kind of my field and my area. And I was writing a whole book about a little known woman writer. And so I was doing a profile of one each month. And uh, as, as a result, um, people started to get to know about my newsletter. You know, it was, it was written up in um, a piece on LitHub and other places. People mentioned it as part of this larger project of recovering women writers. It seems to be, you know, really gaining traction. So if you can tell stories about something interesting related to your subject in your newsletter, and then you also tack on your news of what you're doing, you can start building your newsletter list by creating little freebies, um, little things that uh, that people might want, and uh, you can spread the word about that. So those are kind of some of my general comments about getting started with promoting. Carla, did I see? Um, so I, I mean, I would sec, I would certainly second absolutely everything Anne said um, about promoting you, your starting it sort of as you're thinking of, of the book. Um, but I would also say not er, there are er, all these different platforms and all these different ways of promoting some work for some people and some work for others. So I've always heard it said that, you know, people who really love Twitter don't like Facebook and people who really like Facebook don't like Twitter. Um, and then there are those of us who aren't very, very good at social media at all, but love a live audience. Now in the pandemic that as of course paused but someday there will be live audiences again. I am not particularly good with social media. I have been a terrible disappointment to everybody who knows me in the social media realm, but I love a live audience and I will take any microphone anywhere. You know, give me a microphone and, and I'm a happy camper. And I know that. So when I think about promoting a book, I really try very, very hard to play to my own strengths. So if I'm thinking about promoting a book, I think about all of the places I could give a live talk. Um, and I think about all of the worlds that my subject touched that they might be interested in a talk by me about this subject. Always just play to your own strength. What are you good at? What are you interested in? What will you be able to stick with for years? Because the promotion process goes on for years and years and years. And then do that. Just work to your strengths. I, I, I totally agree. Gretchen, because, as, you, as you answer that, were you ever afraid if you started promoting while you were still working on the book? We got a question about this. Were you ever afraid you'd get scooped? Um, well, I have a quick story about that. But I'm, I want to just say that um, I'm a t social media refuser. I have never been on Facebook. I don't even know what it looks like. I refuse <laughs> I, I don't want anything to do with those people who collect my data. I don't, I'm not on Twitter. I don't do any, I mean, I know about that stuff. I, you know, I, I was a Dean, so I had a communications office, but I just decided it was a time suck and it made me crazy. And it's um, really hurt your career, obviously. Well, yeah, um, well, it's relatively recent that everybody does this, but I just wanted to say, I have a website, Carla and I actually have the same webmaster for our websites. Um, so the website is, is great and people find me all the time. I'm always getting requests for talks and podcasts and things because they just go to my name and it pops up, you know, first is my website. So I'm happy with that. Um, other people are very happy to be using social media, but I can just see that you go down a rabbit hole with that stuff and you're not writing your book <laughs> um, and doing some other things. So I worry about that. The, the scoop is that I actually um, several years ago discovered a 19th century African-American novel that nobody knew about. And I found it by accident and it's a long serendipitous thing. 
So I was going to reveal my finds and what I had researched about this book and this author. And I was on my way to California. I take trains. I don't like the, that's the other thing I don't do is I don't fly if I don't have to. Um, so I've crossed the Atlantic seven times by ship because I go to England a lot. Ah. <laughs> so I refuse a lot of things now. I'm just getting too old to do stuff I hate. But anyway, um, I was on my way to California, which blessedly gave me a couple of days to get there. And I'm on my way to reveal this at a conference. And I thought, oh, someone's going to be sitting in the back of the room writing this down and they're going to find this book. So I called um, somebody who does communications and I said, I think I should do something about this quick. So the conversation is a magazine that presents new research and it, they, in all fields. And so they said, yes, yes, that's a perfect site for it. So I actually wrote it on the train. And the night before I arrived to present my paper, it had been published because it was an online thing. And the, but within a week, it had 70,000 hits. So um, there are ways to get your research out there and claim it. What you don't, you want to be far enough along that no one can catch up to you, you know, that your publication will come before anything if they say, oh, this sounds like a great idea, I'll think I'll do that too. But if you've got several years of research into this subject, they probably can't catch up to you, but you need, it's good to have a contract first. It's, a, it's good to have something to protect you to say that I've laid claim to this. I would be a little nervous about putting out my, my subject and before, um, you know, before I'm ready enough that I can claim it as my own. That's, that's, that's a, a, a great, uh piece of advice. Um, so follow up for one second. Can I just follow up for one second? I just wanted to say that um, social media is not a requirement for being an author. Okay? okay. But being accessible, I think is important, right? Showing having some presence online, having a website. Yeah. If, if you're only comfortable with that, that's fine. But at least have that out there. A newsletter, I think, is a wonderful way to communicate with people and, uh, you know, share your ideas and share what you're doing. Um, and you don't have to, you know, you, there are lots of simple programs that allow you to do this really easy. Squarespace is great for creating a really simple website. It's not hard to do. Anybody can do it. But, you know, put your, put your email address out there and let people show how they can get in touch with you. Give an agent, how they get in touch with an agent. Right. And even if that's all it is, at least you've shown that you are accessible and you have yeah. a presence somewhere. Yep. So don't get too worried about all the other stuff unless it's something that you enjoy. You should never force yourself to do it because you people can tell when you're forcing it and it's not effective. OK, so if, if you want to try to connect with people, have conversations with people, um, then do that. And I think Twitter is a good good way to do that. It's, it's easy to find people and connect with them on Twitter. Facebook is impossible to connect with people. Um, the way that all the log algorithms or however they do it, I would not recommend Facebook at all. Um, don't even worry about that one. So thanks, Anne. So putting aside the social media stuff that is, you know, within the purview of the, of the author, how do you figure out exactly what you can expect your publisher to do for you? You know, there are those wonderful mm -hmm. movies that I was kind of expecting where, you know, the author sits at a table at a fancy restaurant and has a this exchange with the editor and then they're wined and dined and they show up at airports and there's their name on a thing and they're whisked off and it's <laughs> a little disillusioning when you realize that you know there's a question from the publisher of what you want to do in your marketing and they give you they tell you the three things and the one magazine they're going to pay to put you in now for those with bigger trade presses. I understand there's even cutbacks there. So um, uh, let's see, um, Carla, you take first crack. What, what can an author expect and how do, how do you figure that out? So, so first of all, I would say you can expect less and less. And um, <laughs> I mean, everybody's having to cut back. Every, you know, everybody's trying to, in publishing, everybody's trying to survive right now. Um, so you can expect less and less. And the way you figure it out is you actually have really frank conversations. Um, they're, they're not secretive about this. They will tell you what they can and can't do for you. They can always do less for you than you would like. <laughs> um, my last book, um, which came out a few years ago, so it was before the pandemic and the sort of 
enormous crash of, of things in publishing, they did do a tour um, and, they, and I had the best publicist, the best in-house publicist at HarperCollins, a woman who was absolutely extraordinary. And I hired my own publicist for the radio. So she told me what she could do for me and what she could do for me was print reviews. She had incredible connections with print reviews. She was a woman of my generation and that's the world she knew. Um, she knew the world of print reviews and she could get the galleys of my book in front of the key print reviewers and she did. And I said, you know, what about radio and TV? I like to do that. And she said, you know, I do it. It's not really my thing. I don't really love it. I'm not sure I'm great at it. And we worked out an arrangement and I hired a publicist purely for public radio. And I don't know what effect it had on sales, but for me, it was completely worth it because one of the reasons I did that book as a trade book is I wanted to have public conversations about identity and about race and about race and gender. I wanted to be in the public conversation about the long history of the interwoven horrors of American racism and sexism. And she, I ended up with over 80 radio shows. And so it was completely worth it. But I knew what I wanted. I knew what my goals were. And I had that conversation with them. The piece of the, Gretchen said earlier, and she's completely right that the sample chapter nobody remembers and nobody looks back at. But you know what? The piece of your proposal they do remember is the piece where you said, I can get this book in front of the American Association of Optometrists Genealogists. They're all <laughs> gonna want me to talk and they're all gonna buy this book because I have those connections. The marketing division of your publisher, whether it is Norton or Oxford, or Palgrave Macmillan or Harper Collins, they're gonna remember that. And that's the part you are expected to do. You are expected to think about who cares about this book and how do I get it before them? Um, and you don't have to be a social media person to do that. You just have to take on that job of thinking, who's the audience for this? Who cares about this book? The publisher can't do that for you. They can't spend the time it takes to figure that out. That is your job. And if you go into this expecting that movie version where the publisher identifies all of those audiences and it knows that your book is really important to everybody who's involved in the world of dressage, forget it. Because <laughs> they are not going to figure that out. That's your job. So if that's what you're expecting from your publisher, you will be one of those writers who say, oh, the publicity, the promotion department was terrible. They really let me down because you're forgetting it's your job to figure out who the audience is. They'll help you get to that audience, but you have to know who it is and why they care. So I would just say expect less from your publisher and remember your team. You and your publisher are not adversaries. They would like to sell your book, but they have to sell other books. If you can be a team player with them, it makes all the difference in the world. Gretchen, did you have any uh, surprising <sighs> discoveries perhaps earlier in your career? Yeah, um, I was actually surprised by um, several years ago, I had just published a book that I that um, did pretty well. And I was using the publicist for my trade publisher. And I had mentioned to someone from an organization that I like very much that I would love to come talk to them. And so they said, great. Well, what they did was contact the publicist. They didn't ask me directly. And I found out a year or two later, I said, whatever happened, I would have loved to have gone in and given that talk. And they said, oh, your publicist asked for a $5,000 fee to give this talk. And I said, what? I had no idea this was a talk I arranged. They should not be asking for a fee. They're not a publicity agency. They are, a, they work for the publisher and this would have sold books. And so I would just say, be very clear when you're working with a publisher to find out exactly what the publicist will do and not do and make clear to them that like Carla, I like to, to speak in person. I like the radio, I like television, I like those things. And I wanna make sure that if people wanna talk to me that I'm available. To them, you know, I don't want to take, you know, a flight every week to someplace on a tour. I'll go by train, but that's a different story. But um, 
but I, I don't want them to be closing the door on something that I would let very much like to do rather than working on my behalf. She thought she was helping me. I don't know if they were getting a cut, um, but I was very upset. So just be, be clear on what they will do and not do. Agreed. And, and although the tradition was that publicists do command a retainer of thousands of dollars, um, I, one of the beauties of bio is having context to all sorts of people in the publishing world, including publicists. Um, and I would just like to put out there that you can inquire whether they will work on an hourly basis, which is what I was able to get and afford, which was incredibly cost effective. And um, I could dictate what I wanted my one hour phone sessions to cover with everything from how do I contact radio stations or you know help me a little bit on, on an op-ed piece I'm thinking about. So, so there are, and, and publicists these days may be interested, those who are you know maybe not the biggest, but I'd inquire if there's someone that you're interested in or look for those who are willing to do it. And we have several contacts in bio who do do that. I'm only sorry, there was a wonderful, program um, that I listened to bio uh, was of course behind it on publicity during the promotions during the pandemic but unfortunately we didn't record that one um, but there's a little bit of background about it you can look look on the website so continuing on this promotion theme um, tell me another um, Carla what did you learn the hard way about promotions um I mean, I think, I think the thing that I learned the hard way, particularly in the case of the Zora Neale Hurston book, is what a book tour can really be like. Um, and I learned the hard way to let go of my expectations. So um, in, in the book, I did a, a extensive book tour uh, for the Zora Neale Hurston book. And I had some of those same movie images that Marlene was talking about, where I think I imagined a big mahogany table on the second floor of the Barnes and Noble on the Upper West Side. Well, that is not necessarily your great venue. For the Hurston book, the extraordinary venues, and some of you won't be surprised by this, were Southern Black churches where I got audiences in the hundreds and sold so many books, partly because some of those communities were in book deserts where they didn't have good bookstores and they were delighted to just be able to get a copy from me at the front of, of the room. And they were extraordinary audiences. And some of the bookstore venues uh, particularly if I wasn't giving a talk, were not great. You know, people were asking me where the Starbucks was rather than being interested <laughs> in the book. Right. Um, so try to know something about the venue you're going to before you go, if you do any touring. And um, don't assume that the only place you want to give talks or promote your work is in a bookstore. Um, because again, especially for the Hurston, um, the bookstores work, sorry about this, were um, <laughs> the least in some ways uh, interesting venue um, for the work that I was doing. And, and I think I had to learn that a little bit the hard way. I remember being in a, in a bookstore, I don't even remember what state of the country I was in, but it was in a, a basement of an enormous mall and there had been no publicity and I wasn't giving a talk. And it was in a very wealthy white community where I'm not sure they knew who Hurston was. And I think I got four people asking me where the bathrooms were. Yeah. So it was very humbling. You know, I was actually sent there in a plane and put in a nice hotel. And then I had this really ridiculously humbling experience. Um, and I think I hadn't done enough research in advance. So. Gretchen, tell us either your most surprising, you know, what can we learn from your promotion experiences? Oh, I can only echo what Carla says. It's just awful when you get to a bookstore and you find out that even the people working there don't realize why you're there. And they're scrambling to find a card table in the back room and sticking you by, by, by the bathrooms. And it's, <laughs> it, it's just 
totally demoralizing and our people would come up and say, oh, did you write a book? What is it? And they would look at the cover and say, oh, and walk away. I mean, it's just awful. You know, I, I, I would prefer, I think, I think your idea of going to Southern Black churches was brilliant. I mean, you find out where the readers are for the particular thing that you want to do. I don't think bookstore talks, maybe some small independents where they have a, a track record of getting at independent bookstores, getting people through the door because they have, um, have great um, ways of having an old, a list of people. One of the best ones I ever did was at Historic Deerfield, which is a kind of living museum and a historic museum. They have a great re list. Um, the, people had, the people I was writing about had lived in Deerfield and it was nothing like um, going to, a, to the Barnes and Noble talks I gave. It was just more gratifying. I did have a really bad one where I agreed to give a big talk. And I said, I'm fine, I'm happy to do this. I'll take time out of my day to get there and do this. My only um, condition is that you have books there for me to sign and that you will sell the books. And when I got there, there were no books, no hint of a signing. And they said, oh, I guess we forgot. We didn't order any books. And I stood there with a line of people waiting to talk to me about my book, but not a single book to sign or to sell. So, and that really angered me. I actually called them and, and was very angry. I said, that was the only condition, um, you know, my coming to, to you was to do this. And they said, oh, we've been busy. We must have forgotten. We forgot, we didn't order books. So that's my horror story. Just make sure before you get there that you know what you're in for and that what they've promised to do. And can I just add one more thing? We, yeah, we had a good question. Is there a good resource for getting into book clubs? And I would like to suggest, um, and I, I sort of scavenged this from a co-guest on a talk when I saw that her press kit included a Q&A, uh, you know, questions for book clubs about her book. Yeah. And yeah. so now my made myself, the press kit I have for myself is a questions for book groups. Um, you, you all have probably done that or your, or your publicists do that for yeah. you. Carla, what do you want to say? Um, I, I wanted to add one thing to what Gretchen said about making sure the books are going to be there and, and make sure you have handled the logistics of what happens with them afterwards. Um, I have, I, particularly with the Hurston, which as a hardback was, was kind of a doorstop book. It was about 800 pages. And I had situations where I would do a talk and then there would be two boxes of books left over and nobody had been sort of assigned to get those back to the hotel and I have spine problems. And it seems like a small problem, but when you're alone in New Orleans in a bookstore in a mall, it's kind of a big problem. So, so make sure you've handled those logistics. The other thing I wanna say is I saw in the chat, some people wanted to know, how do you, um, how do you get a publicist? So getting a publicist and getting an agent are really different. If you're thinking about getting a publicist, ask all your writer friends who've used one. Never hire a publicist until you talk to other people about if the person is good or bad. It is trickier to ask your writer friends for their agent. Um, most of us uh, have very complicated relationships with our agents and we don't like to ask them to read too many manuscripts of our friends. And there's a, there's a very delicate dance you have to do about that. But that is not true about publicists. You wanna ask, if you're thinking about hiring a publicist, they should give you a list of writers who they have done work for. You should be able to contact them and get recommendations. There's no Angie's list for publicists, but there should be. Um, and you should never hire a publicist where you haven't been able to talk to anybody about it. So with a publicist, just talk to other our writers. The same thing for some of these kinds of resources. This is why organizations like BIO are so important and are so amazing because they enable this kind of resource sharing. So if you want to know, you know, how do I get a publicist or how do I get a publicist who will be hourly or can I do any work with a publicist for $2,000 or you wanna know how do I get into book clubs, organizations like BIO, they are your friends. They will connect you to people who can answer that. That's great, Carla. And uh, before we close, I do want to give another pitch for bio. If you are not a member and we're thrilled you're here today, please join. It is the most uh, reasonable amount 
for all that you get. It also will reduce uh, by a lot. Your uh, fees for attending are what will be wonderful because it always is our conference at the end sometime in May. Um, and also, as I said before, it's Giving Tuesday. So if you are a member or not, please support our 501c3 with a tax deductible gift to bio. And so I'm going to ask for, you know, last word real briefly, start with Anne. Anything else you want to say to our viewers? I, I did want to say um, what I've learned through my journey of promoting my books is um, to not try to do all the things. It is completely overwhelming. All of the advice, you know, all, you know, the latest thing is you have to have at least 50 Amazon reviews. Um, you know, in the first week, or they're not going to show your book. I mean, it's just like one thing after another. It is so incredibly stressful. And I have to say, I got terribly burnt out um, after my last book came out. I overdid it. I spent way too much time on Facebook um, and Twitter and all the places and trying to, you know, I did a pre order giveaway. I was sending out extra newsletters. I was giving interviews. I was flying here and doing that. And it just, it, it really affected my health. So, you know, you, you really don't need to push yourself that hard. Um, I think it's really important to, to consider um, that this is just your first book, right? There will be other books and the more books you write, the more audience you will have. So promoting this one book isn't necessarily the end all and be all, right? This book will still be out there and will still have readers that you can continue to promote as you write new things, right? Uh, so the more you can do to kind of get your name out there and you know share your knowledge with people, uh, the more readers you will have. So it doesn't all necessarily hinge on this one book and the sales figures that first week, you know, which can be overwhelming. That's great advice. Carla, last word. Yes, um, I'm gonna give you my email address. It's c.kaplan at neu.edu. Do not send me your proposal much as I would love to read it. I'm on a book deadline, but I saw some questions in the chat, including a couple specifically for me. I didn't get a chance to answer. And um, in the tradition of bio, which is resource sharing among writers, I want to make sure I answer any questions. So please feel free to email me. Great. Thanks, Carla. Gretchen, bring us home. I guess I would say, believe in your book. Don't write a book that you don't believe in. A book that you want to write as well as you can, that you think the world would like to see. Um, Somehow you can see proposals sometimes for a book that you think this person is just desperate to get a publication. And the best proposals are those that say, oh, this, this book means something to me. And I'm going to bring the best that I have to this book. And it will show. And I just say that's a word of encouragement. When you write a biography, you live with this person for a long time. And you have to have longer than you might have planned. <laughs> More than the person you live with. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last quick story is uh, uh, the great grandchild of, of, of an adult great grandchild of somebody I wrote about was her husband was in the kitchen with my husband. We finally met. And he said, you've been living with Francis Hodgson Burnett, one of my biographies for a long time. How do you feel? And my husband said, yes, I have. And I would like my wife back. <laughs> <laughs> You all have been great and uh, just, I think exemplary of what bio brings to One us. Thing. Okay. Make sure if you want to save the chat, do it now because once once we all leave, we can't save it anymore. So if you might if you want to save it, do it now. I think you can um, Hit the file button. Remember how to do that? It's, there's a file button somewhere. Oh, right. So if you go yeah. into the chat, there's a file button, there's a little the three dots, click on that and it says save chat. Always helpful. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Anne. And especially to Michael Gately for keeping us all on the screen. So be kind and give. Thanks, everybody. The one for the stuff you put in the chat. Lots of great resources in there. Yes, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marlene. Bye. Bye.